Hello. Uh, this is an attempt to capture a sermon that I preached on the 10th of October um, as part of our doctrine series. Um, unfortunately, we had some technical difficulties, which meant that the, uh, the sermon wasn't recorded and we have no audio or video footage. So I've uh, been asked to preach it again. Um, so this evening, and it is this evening, um, I am going to make a further attempt to, uh, to tell you all about the doctrine of salvation. So, as I said, we're going to continue in our teaching series on the, uh, looking at some of the foundations or doctrines of the Christian faith, at what we believe as Christians and why we believe them. Now, as I was preparing for this sermon, I was struggling for a, um, a sermon illustration, and I was racking my brains, and, and I was re- really struggling. And, then, and then, an inc- then something happened, and I think it um, captured perfectly about me and, uh, and about where we are with, with sin. So those of you who know me well um, know that I've got a bit of a passion, um, and that passion is rugby and playing rugby. Um, lockdown has meant that, um, that my retirement for rugby has uh, gone on a bit further than perhaps I would like or my body can cope with. Um, but I'm determined to go out with a bang rather than a whimper. So... I'm still playing. And a few weeks ago, um, there was an opportunity for me to uh, pull my boots on, uh, which I did, and I turned out for Blamford um, against a a team from Poole. Um, I was uh, on the bench, so I was a substitute, and about 20 minutes into the game, somebody got injured, and it was my turn to go on. And uh, I think I went on, and I think I was on the pitch for about three minutes, and there was a bit of a, an incident, and the whistle went, and um, the play stopped, and all I could hear was number three, which was the number I was wearing. And I hadn't realised I was wearing number three, I'd just thrown the shirt on and hadn't really realised what number I was. And um, I just walked away, just kept walking, and then he kept saying, the, ref kept saying, the referee kept saying, number three, number three. So I suddenly worked out he meant me. And uh, he turned around and looked at me, and uh, he beckoned me over. It was a bit like a naughty schoolboy moment. I got the finger, come over here, come and stand here. Um, And before me was laid out my misdemeanour. What I'd done wrong, and how I'd broken the rules. And uh, ended up that I got a yellow card. And I was straight off the pitch for ten minutes. Um, It's I held another club record of the person that's uh, got a yellow card being the least amount of time on the pitch but that's another story there was nothing I could do and I was really embarrassed I, I, I still couldn't quite work out what I'd done but I'd obviously done something wrong and I was off it was even more embarrassing because there was somebody from this church here watching on the sidelines and there's photographic evidence of the incident which I won't show It is to my eternal shame that that is on YouTube um, or on Facebook, and you can see that, but I'm not going to tell you where it is. In all the years I've been playing, I've never had a yellow card. And, um, yeah, I'm I'm somewhat ashamed of that. So that brings us on to to our doctrine of salvation. When we talk about doctrines, these are big topics. And as Dale has said to us, Each foundation we've looked at merits a sermon series of its own. But what we want to do in this short series, what we've tried to do in this short series, is to set you thinking and hopefully wanting to know more, to go a bit deeper. And I'd encourage you to go back continually to God's word. Test what's being said. All of what what we're saying from the front is in there. And what I hope and pray you'll see is the rich tapestry of God's plan for humanity and for you as a follower of the one true God. So, so far in our doctrine series, we've looked together at God, his creation, humanity, who we are in relationship with God. Dale spoke about the problem of sin and what sin does to our relationship with God. And now we move on to find out what God has done about the problem of sin. In this talk, we're going to look at the doctrine of salvation. Now, it could be me, but in Christian culture these days, salvation is perhaps an underused word. 
we often hear that someone's been born again, or that someone has given their heart to Jesus, or that someone has become a believer. But what seems to have gone out of fashion is the use of the term that someone's been saved, or salvation. And I suspect there's a reason for this. And that could be because when we talk about being saved, or salvation, we have to explain what we're being saved from. And this brings us on to the subject of sin, which is often in conflict with today's culture and society. And it's to that end that we as Christians need to be clear and and unambiguous as we present the gospel of Jesus Christ to others. So, we're going to spend some time together looking at the why, the how, and the what. The why of salvation. Why do we need to be saved? What's my problem? What's our problem? The how of salvation. How God offers us salvation. The what of salvation. What is or should be our response to to God's promise of salvation? You see, of all the doctrines of the Bible... The doctrine of salvation is the one which we as Christians should be most familiar. Because our salvation and our eternity depends on it. Because it's the one message which we as God's people have been commissioned to share with the world around us. And it's the only message whereby people can come into a personal and saving relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ the Son. So let's start with a bit of scripture. Let's go to the book of Ephesians and the beginning of chapter 2, where it says, And you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passion of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by very nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised up with him and seated with him in his heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. For by grace you have been saved by faith, and and this is not by your own doing, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This passage for me, and there are other passages available, encapsulates perfectly God's salvation in one neat package. It tells us of the problem, it tells us of the solution, and it tells us how we should respond. We've looked at the doctrine of man and the doctrine of sin. Dale taught us that in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve sinned against God, and because of their sin, all of us are born with a sinful nature. Because of this, by our very nature, we are predetermined to sin. The Bible tells us that we've got a DNA of sin. And the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Romans, confirms this and makes it abundantly clear. In Romans chapter 3, 23, he says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And he goes on to say in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Therefore, Just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. From the moment we come into this world, it's our inescapable destiny. We are all born with a natural bent towards sin and it's a universal thing. We sin because we're sinners. In the eyes of a perfect and righteous God, because that's what he is, no one sin is worse than another. There's no hierarchy of sin, no grading. A sin is anything that, falls short, that makes us fall short of the glory of God. And because God is perfect and righteous, God, our, our sin has consequences. And the first one being that sin separates us from God. 
In the Garden of Eden before the fall, Adam and Eve had fellowship with God. But after the fall, their fellowship with God is broken. The result is that all of us are born out of fellowship with God. And the prophet Isaiah confirms this when he says in chapter 59, verses 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Scripture is clear. It tells us that the problem of sin is one which we can't solve on ourselves. There is absolutely nothing we can do to restore us back to the relationship that Adam and Eve had before they ate of the fruit. Despite the truth of God's word, when we come up against, up, up against the issue of our separation from God, man has come up with lots of different ways of dealing with this problem. One is salvation by works, it's set, which says, if you do enough good deeds while you're on earth, someday, when you stand before God, he will put all your good deeds on one side of the scale and your bad deeds on the other side of the scale. And if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, then you're okay. You just have to be good enough. This is an arrogance. This is the arrogance of man. But the Bible, again, is clear on this subject. Scripture's clear. Paul, again, in the book of Titus, chapter 3, verse 5, tells us that he, God, saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. And as we heard earlier in the passage from uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, we are saved by, by grace, through faith, not through our own doing. Our salvation is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast about how good they've been. The one thing we need to to acknowledge when we talk about doctrine is it needs to, one doctrine needs to be consistent with another. So in highlighting the doctrine of salvation, this must be in line with the doctrine of God. And Emma spoke about the doctrine of God. We heard that God is a righteous and perfectly just God. Because of his righteousness, God cannot look upon sin and therefore there has to be a consequence for our sin. But our God is a just God, and his, God, and his justice demands that, the, that our sin be dealt with and punished. Anything less would, be, would not be in line with what we know is the character of God. In our sin, we not only separate ourselves from God, our sin condemns us before God. And the punishment due, my friends, is not 10 minutes in the sin bin. The penalty, the scripture's clear, the penalty for our sin is death. It's that eternal separation from God. And Romans in Romans chapter 6, it summarizes it completely when it says, for the wages of sin is death. And given this, we're in big trouble. At some point, we will all stand before God and have to give an account for how we lived our lives. And there's no set of scales. A sin is a sin. We're in a desperate situation. There's no argument because God is righteous and just, as we just heard. He must punish sin. And because we're all, all sinners, we are condemned before a holy and righteous God. And knowing that we can't do anything in ourselves to escape that punishment, but God can do something, and he has done something. He's dealt with the problem of once and for all. Again, we need to look back at the doctrine of God, to his character, to find out more. We need to understand how God has dealt with the problem of sin in the light of what he reveals about himself. And in the book of 2 Peter, chapter, um, verses, chapter 3, verses 9, it says this, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but he's patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but all should reach repentance. How God deals with the problem of sin is rooted and grounded in the very character of God himself. 
And Brooke taught us about the doctrine of humanity. If you remember, we heard that God created us for his glory and for fellowship. But there's a problem, as we've just heard. Because as long as we remain in our sin, we cannot either be in fellowship with God, nor can our sinful lives give him glory. There must, for us to live for, um, for our purpose of fellowship and glory to him, be a way to be reconciled to God. And this, my friends, is the message of the gospel. This is the message of God's salvation for his people. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, it says this, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Salvation is from God. If it, would le- if it was left for us, Left up to us, we would forever be lost. It is God who begins the act of our salvation, and it's God who finishes it. As we heard earlier, in um, just a few minutes ago, regarding in the passage from 2 Peter, the reason why God saves us has less to do with who we are and more to do with who God is. It's God's mercy which stays his hand of judgment against us, because he's loving and compassionate, not wishing that any should perish, but all should reach repentance. Together with God's mercy comes his grace, and God's grace is undeserved by us. It's his unmerited favour towards us. We do not deserve it. We can't earn it. His graciousness, and therefore grace towards us, again is in God's character. And because God is merciful and loving and gracious, He offers us salvation. He does not offer us salvation because of who we are. He offers it to us because of who he is. That means because of God's mercy, he does not punish us the minute we sin. And because of his grace, he offers us that forgiveness of sin, salvation from the penalty of sin, that eternal death. How did God make it possible for us to be saved? Well, this is where we need to look at the cross and the atoning sacrifice of Christ. The cross is where the problem of our sin is dealt with. At the cross, we're reconciled with God. You see, in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we have our salvation. Without it, we have no salvation. And one of the most famous verses in the Bible says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. We read in scripture that God's justice demands a sacrifice which will pay the price for sin. Our lives are already forfeit because we're under the judgment and condemnation of sin. Only a sacrifice, untainted by sin, could pay the price and be an acceptable substitute for us. And that's the reason why God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. Because Jesus was sinless. He was an acceptable sacrifice for our sins. The Bible says that that Jesus was a, a propitiation for our sins, not only for ours, but for the whole world. This simply means that Jesus was the sacrifice which turned away the wrath and judgment of God. When Christ died on that cross at Calvary, he died in our place. And this is what it means when we talk about, um, the t- when you might hear the term sub- substitutionary atonement or the vicarious death of Jesus. Jesus died in our place. The death of Jesus was foreshadowed by the sacrificial system under the Old Covenant in the Old Testament. In ancient Israel, each year the high priest would take a spotless lamb and would sacrifice that lamb, taking its blood and sprinkling it on the Ark of the Covenant to cover or atone for the sins of the people for that year. This is a picture that points us towards points us towards what Jesus would do. His blood, Jesus' blood, would not only just cover our sins, 
Indeed, it would wash away our sins, making us right before a just God. When Jesus died on the cross, he took our place and paid the penalty for our sins. And that's why the cross is so central to our understanding of salvation. And in the book of Hebrews, it says this, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. On the cross, Jesus was the spotless Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world by his shed blood to atone for our sins. In his resurrection from the dead, he defeated death. We believe that it was absolutely necessary for Jesus to shed his blood for us on the cross. Otherwise, the demands of a holy and righteous God could not have been met and therefore no salvation and absolutely no hope for you and me. Before the cross, at, at that last supper table, Jesus told his disciples, for this is my blood that establishes the covenant. It is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. You see, because the blood of Jesus was shed for you and me, for our sins on Calvary's cross, there is no other way for us to be rid of sins except through Jesus. Jesus said in the book of John again, I am the way, I am the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And this is the truth of the doctrine of salvation, that there is no other way to get saved except through Jesus. And there are many that might have problems with that truth. Some might say that there are many ways to God, but this denies the truth found in God's word. God would have been justified in turning his back on us and sending us all to hell. None of us deserves to be saved. But because God is gracious and merciful and because he so loves the world, God has made salvation possible through that atoning sacrifice of his son. Salvation is open to anyone. No one is excluded. It's possible for any of us to be saved. But at the end of the day, we cannot escape the words of Jesus himself, who said that he is the only way to God the Father. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Again, that's the message of the gospel. Salvation is offered freely to all who accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. God saves us because of who he is. And he did it through the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Jesus died in our place because he was sinless. He was an acceptable sacrifice to satisfy the demands of a righteous God. Salvation is a gift of grace offered to all who will believe. So how do we receive this gift? What's the process by where, whereby we become recipients of his grace and become Christians? And this is where we need to go back to scripture again. The Apostle Peter, when preaching at Pentecost, called upon the crowd to repent and be baptised. Each of you, in the name of Jesus the Messiah, for the, forgiveness, for the forgiveness of your sins. The Apostle Paul said that God now commands all people everywhere to, to repent. And repentance means simply to stop going one way, to turn around and go another and biblical repentance is a response to God's love by changing your convictions and actions. Turning towards God and away from whatever dishonours him. In other words, turning away from sin. It's about surrender to the belief that you're, that, that you're not in control and acknowledging who God is. But please note this. Despite that assurance of salvation, despite what God has done on, for us on the cross, we will struggle with sin. And we'll continue to struggle with, with sin. The work still needs to be done in us. There remains that conflict between the spirit and the flesh. And sometimes we give in. But giving in to sin is no longer the norm. The practice of sin is, is not, is, will, will disappear. As we grow in grace and, in, and, in, and the knowledge of the Lord, we are being sanctified. 
As we're led by the Spirit, we'll walk more and more in obedience to the Word of God. Repentance is not a popular concept these days. Many people want to get to heaven without having to change who they are. They want to add Jesus to the many other things in their lives. But Jesus tells us we cannot come to him in that way. We must take up our cross and follow him. In repentance, we turn away from sin, and in faith, we turn to Jesus Christ, our Saviour. And that brings us to the subject of faith. In our verse in, from Ephesians, we learn that salvation comes through grace alone, through faith alone, and through Christ alone. God's grace makes salvation available to us, but we are to accept it through faith, which allows us to receive it. Faith means to believe. It means to put your trust or confidence in someone or something. The command of God through his word is to believe, and this is referring to faith. To receive the salvation offered in Christ Jesus, we must let go of any reliance that we might have on our own goodness or in our ability to get to heaven on our own efforts. We must put our faith, our confidence, our trust in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. Faith is not simply just about the knowledge that Jesus died for your sins. It's not just merely agreeing that Jesus died. Many people have religious knowledge. But true faith means making a decision and a commitment to surrender your control of your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and to trust in him and him alone to save you. The Bible says that in the repentance of sin and placing your trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour, you become a new creation. You're given a, a spiritual life or you're born again. The theological term is regeneration, which simply means that you're made new in Christ. In Corinthians it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. And the Bible says that God gives you eternal life. That means once you are truly saved, you can never be unsaved. Once he gives you spiritual life, you are his from that time forevermore. When you ask Jesus to forgive your sins and place your trust in him, he places his Holy Spirit within you and he will never leave or forsake you. He will always be with you. He writes your name in the book of life and when the roll is called up, you'll be there. But until then, he'll work in your heart and your life to grow grow you in your spiritual life to a greater maturity. Then this is what, what... what we might hear termed as sanctification. The book of Philippians says, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. That means that God, who has begun the work of transforming you into the image of Jesus, will continue to do this until he takes you home or Jesus returns again. So in conclusion... This is the doctrine of salvation. We are sinners born into sin. Our sin separates us from a just and holy God and condemns us to an eternity in hell. But God loves us and sent his only son Jesus to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. Through his death, burial and resurrection, he defeated sin and death and made it possible for all who place their trust in him to have their sins washed away and receive eternal life. All we have to do is have faith to believe, to place your trust in him. Salvation is by grace alone, by faith alone, and most definitely by Christ alone.